If you were the only one who can save the future president of the United States from an army of psycho killers, what would you do? The entire country's in chaos, and the very top leaders want you dead. So I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the killer politicians in the purge election year. This man and woman have the fate of the entire country in their hands. They are about to face dozens of assassins as the streets burn in utter chaos around them. If they can just survive the night, they can put an end to the senseless violence for good. This group of corrupt politicians here are the new founding fathers of America. Among their many horrible acts, they support an event called The Purge across the country, where every year all crime is legal for 12 hours. Led by the current US president, the group is desperate for their candidate to win the upcoming presidential elections. Their candidate Owens is a religious minister and is also at the table to discuss his path to victory. The group discusses his opponent for the elections, being dismissive of her chances at first. But when they find out that she's gaining in popularity and has a chance to beat him, Owen starts looking afraid. The president is furious and swears that they should do everything possible to eliminate her as a threat. Sometime later, this woman, Senator Charlie Roan, debates Owens in front of a crowd of people. The man argues that the purge is a good thing because it gives citizens a chance to release their frustrations and cleanse the nation. However, the senator points out that it's just a way for his party to make money while killing off the poor without consequences. She assures the public that she will stop the annual purge if they elect her president. The senator climbs down from the stage and mingles with the crowd while her opponent stays above them, shouting that the nation needs to be purged. While the people are happy to speak with her, the woman's security chief gets nervous. This man, Leo, knows that Charlie is too valuable to the future of America to get hurt. He deploys his men to keep a closer watch on her as she continues to interact with the crowd. Meanwhile, the debate is playing on TV at a small deli. The owner agrees with Charlie's policies, but is not hopeful that she can make a real change. His assistant disagrees, believing that she can build a better future for working class people like that. One day before this year's purge begins, the White House has a major announcement. For the first time in history, high-ranking political officials will not be exempt from the purge. This means that even members of the government, like the senator here, can be legally murdered. Her team instantly recognizes this as a huge threat to her life and gets nervous. Leo tries to persuade her to hide out in a safe house for the duration of the upcoming purge, but the woman refuses refuses. She wants to show her supporters that she is truly one of them and does not want to run away or hide behind special protection, making it clear she'll stay in her home for purge night. This has Leo worried. He knows that he will need to make extra preparations to keep his boss safe and agrees to do it. But this was their biggest mistake. Okay, this is a total death wish. It is crystal clear why those in charge changed the rules to allow killing political officials after years of keeping to tradition. They want to eliminate the senator during the upcoming purge and face no consequences for it. Knowing that it will be the president and the government themselves coming after her, staying home during purge night is simply not an option. These people have billions of dollars at their disposal and influence at every level of the community. It is perfectly reasonable to expect that they are both willing and capable of blowing up an entire city block and murder dozens of of innocent people just to kill her. Not only will this be fully legal since it would occur on purge night, but the government can bribe independent militia groups to do this for them, then claim that it was an independent act of terrorism. This means that no amount of good preparations or improved security at the senator's house can prevent what these very powerful men are planning to do. If I were Leo here, I would never have agreed to this and worked hard to change the senator's mind about using a safe house. Since she clearly cares more about the people than herself, the best way to convince her would be to stop harping on points about her personal safety and instead plan her good nature. I would explain that as the future president of the nation who can save everyone from the annual purges, it is her duty to stay alive. This is not a selfish act, but rather a necessity to protect the people because she is the only one who is popular and well-connected enough to rise to power and change the system for them. Playing further into her reluctance to receive special treatment, I would empathize that it isn't really about her at all, but about protecting any candidate on their side who happens to have the power to change the country. Once she's convinced, the focus here should be finding a safe place that is hard to find at all, rather than one which can be heavily defended. Since the enemy likely has weapons capable of completely destroying a wide area, it really doesn't make much of a difference if it has advanced locks or fancy security cameras. Leo's best move here would actually be to take the senator out of town alone, ditching all their electronics and vehicles or anything that can be used to track them. Then, using fake identities to ride a vehicle, they should drive into a rural and forest area to camp out for the night. This makes it difficult to launch a tactical attack on the senator as there will be no maps of the area and heavy cover from helicopters or sniper fire. Thankfully, the four most forested states in the United States, Maine, New Hampshire, West Virginia, and Vermont, are all near the East Coast and within a day's drive from the senator's house in Washington, D.C. With the purge quickly approaching, foreigners have also arrived from all over the world to join the killing. 
they look forward to being able to murder and riot on the craziest night of the year. At the deli, the owner Joe catches these two students stealing some candy. He approaches them and gives them a chance to give it back without calling the cops. They are not afraid of him and refuse, threatening that they will turn the tables on him if he doesn't leave them alone. Just then, a woman appears and tells the girls to give the candy back. They instantly recognize her as a local legend and someone not to be messed with. The student sneers they give the candy back to Joe before leaving the store. They have clearly not learned their lesson. Joe thanks the woman Lainey for her help. She's an old friend of his who used to shoplift from his deli herself, but has since reformed. Joe gets a phone call from his insurance company. They inform him that their terms have changed and they will have to drop coverage for his store unless he pays them a large amount of money. Joe is furious. He can't afford it and knows that this means his deli will be completely unprotected during the purge. Thinking that he will lose everything if he lets the deli get destroyed on purge night, he makes a plan to defend it from looters through the night by himself. Both Lady and his assistant warn him that this will be very dangerous, but the man is determined to protect what he's made. At the senator's house, Leo is prepping his team to keep guard over her for the night. He deploys guards to each room of her house, including some to keep watch outside. Leo has also added barricades to all the doors and windows to her home. The whole house will be monitored from a central command post, which has a view of the security footage from the many cameras around the premises. Charlie will have to stay in her office, which is the safest room in the house, where she will be protected by these guards. As night falls, Leo gives Charlie a final briefing, warning her not to leave the room for any reason till the purge is over. All his men are in place, with his most trusted assistants overseeing the monitors at the command post. At the deli, Joe locks up and climbs into the roof. He pulls out a pistol and a rifle, ready to defend his business through the long night. Meanwhile, on the streets, Lainey gets into a makeshift ambulance with a friend. Since medical services are suspended during the purge, they will be driving around to provide emergency help to anyone who needs it. It is a very dangerous job, but the woman seems unfazed. That's when an announcement plays over all TVs across the country. It reminds citizens that all crime will be legal for the next 12 hours, and no one is safe. As the message ends, terrifying sirens ring out across the public broadcast system. The purge has begun. Okay, Leo's plan here is a huge mistake. Getting all these men on board to guard the senator makes her less rather than more safe. Given the deep pockets of the new founding fathers, no one else can be trusted. Even if the men on his team are genuinely good people, almost anyone can be bribed, blackmailed, or coerced into turning on them. Since all crime will be legal for 12 hours during the purge, there is nothing stopping the new founding fathers from kidnapping the child of one of Theo's men and forcing them into killing the senator in exchange for their child's life. Regardless of their loyalty, almost no parent would sacrifice their own flesh and blood for a woman they barely know. Liu here knows that not all of his men, if any, have been turned on him. Otherwise, they could simply surround and overpower him on the spot. This means that any traitors in the ranks or assassins looking on breaking in will be planning on killing Charlie very quickly before they can be overpowered by the other guards. Leo here should use this to his advantage and hire a body double to lock herself in the senator's office for the duration of the purge. Since his rules are that no one enters her office but him, everyone else will be fooled as they will only see this woman from far away. Anyone looking to kill the senator quickly before escaping will not have much time to study the woman's face and kill the double instead. Many common methods of killing quickly and decisively, such as an explosion or gunshot to the head, also involve the victim's face getting disfigured. This makes it even more difficult for potential killers to notice that they have killed the wrong woman. Now as for Joe here, he's putting himself in so much unnecessary danger. The roof he chooses to keep watch from is surrounded by taller buildings and the rooftops of nearby buildings. This means that there are a hundred different places all around him which someone can shoot him from before he even has a chance to react. If the deli is left unguarded, it is only in danger of attracting looters. But with Joe sitting on the roof like an easy target, he will attract additional attention and draw in any perjurer looking to kill someone for fun too. If Joe absolutely wants to be there, the best place for him to keep watch will be from within the store where there are only two entrances and shutters on both doors. This minimizes his disadvantage of being on his own as any attackers will have to come through the narrow door one at a time, giving him the chance to shoot them as they enter. Ironically, the best way he can defend his store would actually be to leave a simple note at the entrances saying this deli contains no valuables and is booby trapped to kill. This would deter both looters and killers because it informs them that there is nothing to steal and no one to kill inside. Even purchasers with a specific vendetta against Joe, like the shoplifters will think twice before entering, likely figuring that the chance to vandalize the store isn't worth risking their lives. With the purge in full swing, Lainey sees the utter chaos as she drives through the streets. People have gathered in hordes to riot, many factions are roving with weapons, and there are public beheadings as people cheer. At the deli, Joe's assistant Marcos arrives to help him defend the store, but suddenly they spot a car wrapped in light 
lights, blaring loud music as it pulls up. It's the shoplifters from earlier, armed with guns, and they've returned with another friend. They have come for revenge of the owner and have no qualms about killing the man. Their leader threatens Joe, bragging she's already killed her parents and that he is next. As she's about to attack, Marcos shoots her in the ear. This scares the gang off for the time being, and they drive away, but the men know they'll be back. At the senator's home, these two men of the security team tamper with the surveillance monitor. They are traitors working with someone to kill Charlie, and this guard sends out a message for the assassins to make a move. Suddenly, a group of gunmen dressed in black ambush the guards outside, killing them. These men are heavily armed, and it's clear they're not only professionals, but have come here to kill the senator. The traitorous guard goes to the front door and lets the assassins inside. At the same time, Leo tries to reach the guards outside on his walkie-talkie, but doesn't get an answer from anyone. Knowing something is wrong, he checks the cameras and realizes that someone has sabotaged the feed. He fixes it and sees that all the guards outside have been killed. Leo springs into action and rushes into the senator's office. He tells her they are being attacked and unveils a secret trap door in the floor. Using it to get outside, the bodyguard quickly kills two assassins and tells the woman they will have to run for it. Back at the office, the two traitors break in to find her gone. They discover the trap door and know that she's trying to escape. One of them spots the pair from a window and a sniper starts to shoot at them. The survivors duck for cover as fast as possible, but Leo is shot in the shoulder. In the midst of firing back in desperation, Leo takes out his phone and activates a device. This makes a suitcase of the senator's office start to beep, and the traitor realizes too late that it's a bomb. Before anyone can escape the room, it blows up in a massive explosion. This gives Leo and Charlie the chance to run away. The two traitors and a gunman are killed in the blast, but the mercenary leader has survived and instructs his remaining men to go after the pair. Running through the streets, the survivors find two bodies dressed in red, white, and blue. It's strange, but as they're walking past them, the bodies spring to life and attack them with weapons. Leo shoots and kills them, but another man ambushes him from inside a car. As Charlie tries to help him, they are both ambushed from behind by perjurers dressed as Uncle Sam and the Statue of Liberty. These are the foreign tourists who have come to enjoy American culture, and more importantly, join the perch. The whole thing has been a trap for anyone unlucky enough to cross their paths, and no one is coming to save them. Okay, Leo and Charlie let their fear take over here, causing them to make the wrong decisions. With the assassins still after them and the streets filled with dangerous perjurers, they should have stopped running and acting like easy prey. These murder tourists have said themselves that they are out for blood because it is fun. And the same goes for the local perjurers who are having the time of their lives killing people at random. This means that anyone perceived to be an easy kill be attacked on sight. The first thing Leo and Charlie should have done after escaping the house is to find a disguise so the assassins no longer recognize them. Using the dead bodies that litter the street, they could change their clothes and even smear their faces with any face paint or blood they can find. This is a common look for purgers and will help them blend in with the others roaming the streets. Next, as soon as they saw the purge sanitation services truck pass by, they should have climbed on board. This gives them the chance to play dead and lay low among the other dead bodies in the truck until it has driven a safe distance away. According to purge etiquette, vehicles that provide services such as ladies' ambulance or this sanitation truck will not be attacked. If the drivers refuse to let them on board, Leo can knock them out and steal their clothes to as the sanitation workers. This may be a bit cold, but the senator's survival here is more important than people who are knowingly risking their lives by being out on purge night. With that said, the way that Leo and Charlie walked into an ambush by foreign purgers also could have been easily avoided. The elaborate makeup and costumes the bodies are wearing show that they are willing purgers, people who seek out violence by killing others for sport on purge night. This means that they are sadistic and unhinged, way too dangerous to approach even if they are genuinely wounded. This is also an indication that they love the theatrics of the purge, and it would not be a stretch to imagine that they are capable of being equally dramatic and playing dead to spring a trap on unlucky passers-by. Even more suspicious is the fact that these bodies have no visible wounds, and the walls of the building and car they are slumped against have no blood splatter on them. This doesn't make sense, because these people are posed as if they died instantly in a big fight, but a gunshot or slash wound would have left a bloody mess around their bodies. As a habit, Leo should give these lunatics the violence they want and shoot any bodies they come across in the head to make sure they are dead before approaching. The mob of foreign purgers drag Leo and Charlie to the middle of the road, preparing to execute them. At that moment, Joe and Marco spot the commotion near the deli and come to help. Before the purchase can react, the men shoot down the entire mob and save their lives. With no time to lose, all four survivors retreat into the deli where Joe and Marcos recognize the senator immediately. The older man is surprised that she is out in public on the purge night and asks what happened. Charlie tells him that her opponent, the minister, has sent men to kill them and that the assassins are still after them. Suddenly, the car with fairy lights returns. The shoplifters have come back with buzzsaws and they have brought even more of their friends with them. 
them. Speaking through the store's cameras, these teenagers tell Joe that they are going to kill everyone inside and burn his deli to the ground. They're trapped, and with no other choice, Joe calls Lady for help. When she doesn't pick up, he leaves her a message that their lives are in danger and she needs to come rescue them. The teenagers pull out buzz saws and start to cut through the deli's doors. These thieves are totally insane and start dancing and singing in the street as they prepare to kill Joe and his friends. At that moment, Lady arrives in her van. Stepping on the gas, she mows down two crazy teens on the road before getting out of the vehicle and shooting the others who are attacking the deli's front door. With the road clear, the survivors go outside and head for Lady's car to take them to safety, but Joe is reluctant. He sees that more thieves are sawing through the deli's back door and wants to stay to defend his business. His assistant convinces him to leave, saying that his life is more important than the store and that protecting the senator is just as important. It convinces him and they leave the deli together. As the survivors travel to a safe place in Lady's van, they spot a helicopter above. It's the assassin leader and his men. They open fire on the vehicle with a Gatling gun, killing the civilian who was receiving medical treatment inside. Acting quickly, the survivors manage to drive under a highway bridge and stay out of sight from the helicopter. They figure out that the men have managed to track them somehow, and Leo realizes that the bolt in his shoulder is a tracker. He uses the van's medical forceps to painfully pry it from his wound. Taking a look around, the survivors spot a group of tough men fighting for sport nearby using medieval weapons. These guys look like trouble, but they can't get away without the assassin spotting them from above. Things get even more dangerous when the fighters spot the van and surround it. The men start to pound on the doors violently and demand to be let in. That's when Joe gets a clever idea and whistles out a distinctive tune. This stops the gangsters in their tracks as they recognize it and whistle back. Joe shares that he used to be a part of the Crips gang many years ago and still knows their signals. Recognizing that the survivors aren't their enemy, the men stand by peacefully as they open the van doors. The leader comes to greet them carrying an injured man, asking that the survivors help save his friend. Okay, this is the luckiest break the survivors have had all night. This group of a dozen strong, coordinated men are about to owe them a favor. These men will likely be delighted to take out the assassins because the survivors will save their friend, and the men after Charlie are obvious scumbags with visible racist slogans on their clothes. Even better, the assassins have no idea that they have found the tracker or that these men exist. This means that they will not even expect that the tracker is showing anything other than the position of Leo and Charlie. If I were in Leo's shoes, I would use the fighters to lead the men on a long and difficult wild goose chase. I would give them the tracker bullet and tell them the enemy is tracking it by air. If the fighters stay under the cover of the highway bridge or use trees and buildings to block the helicopter's line of sight, the assassins will be forced to chase them on foot. This would only play into our hands because the fighters can take the tracker far away in one direction while I escape with the senator in the other way. Since the fighters are physically fit and know the city well, they can easily lead them on a chase for hours. When the assassins do catch up with them, they are in for a nasty surprise because the fighters outnumber them and have a whole cache of weapons at their disposal. It doesn't matter if not all the assassins are killed. The only aim here is to keep the senator alive till the purge is over, and it becomes too risky for the ruling party to commit a crime by trying to murder her again. Once Leo and Charlie slip away from the assassins, they can take full advantage of the senator's popularity. True to her values, Charlie lives in a poor neighborhood within walking distance of Joe's simple deli. Her continued empathy towards the working class is entirely different from Minister Owen's strong stance against them and has won her many fans. In fact, there is a nationwide movement of working class people in support of the senator and her beliefs. This means means that it is very likely the residents of this neighborhood will be willing to help her if they encountered her on the street. By asking Joe or Lainey for advice on who is likely to help if approached, they can knock on the door of one of the area's residents. If they can find someone with a home who agrees with the cause and wants to protect Charlie too, Leo and Charlie can hide out in the resident's house for the rest of the night. It will be impossible for the assassins to track them down there because this resident has no known connection with the senator and, to the outside world, simply appears to be keeping to their house for the night as expected. Knowing his helicopter can't fly under the highway, Way, the lead assassin sends his men after Leo and Charlie on foot. He sends them the location of the tracker and instructs them to capture the pair. Arriving at the coordinates, two men find the place empty and notice the tracker on the ground. Just then, a bunch of gangsters appear behind them. They have come to kill the men in exchange for the survivors doing them a favor and saving their friend. The lead assassin can only listen over his walkie-talkie as his men are gunned down with the fighters and realize he's been tricked. The survivors arrive at an underground triage center where injured victims of the purge and homeless people can hide out for the night. They meet the resistance leader, this man Dante, who has been speaking out and fighting against the new founding fathers for some time now. Speaking with Senator Rowe, Dante learns that his enemies behind her attempted murder. The two disagree on how to defeat the new 
two founding fathers, with Charlie refusing to stoop to their level of violence, and Dante arguing that violence is the only way to get things done. With the senator now safe, the other survivors leave to return to the deli, while Leo stays behind to watch over Charlie. As he's looking around the facility, Leo spots a back room guarded by Dante's men. Sneaking inside the room, he sees blueprints and pictures of new founding father members on the wall. Just then, he is caught by Dante's men, and a fight quickly breaks out. Leo gets the upper hand and holds one of them hostage. The senator hears the commotion and walks in as Dante's lieutenant calms everyone down. She demands to know what is going on and spots the plans on the wall, figuring out that Dante and his men are going to kill Minister Owens at a church he will visit in a few hours. She is furious. She asks Dante's men to call their leader and tell him to call off the assassination. In the senator's mind, she can win the presidency fair and square and will not have her opponent's cause strengthened by making him a martyr. Dante's men refuse and tell her that it's too late to change the plan. Suddenly, Lainey's friend walks into the room and warns them that trucks are approaching their underground facility. Even though the new founding fathers have no idea that the senator is there, they have sent an army here to kill Dante and will kidnap her if she doesn't leave. As the others prepare for a gun battle, Leo and Charlie escape out a back door. Walking along an alley, they trigger a tripwire and nearly escape a giant blade trap that swings down inches from their heads. Calling Lainey for help, they see her car pull up and quickly get inside, where Joe and Marcos have been waiting. With the five survivors reunited, the bodyguard asks Lainey to drive out of the city entirely so they can lay low until the purge is over. Okay, the senator here is making no sense. Having Dante's group kill her opponent is not a bad thing, and certainly not something she needs to push back against so harshly. Many neighbors would have already seen that her house has blown up, and the bodies of her security team are all over the porch and roof. It'll be clear to everyone that she's a victim too. The new founding fathers were the ones who publicly revoked the purge rules, protecting government officials, which was aired on national TV across the whole country. Since this was an important broadcast, involving life and death consequences for all residents, the public would have tuned in and have very very clear evidence that the new founding fathers are the real reason both Senator Roan and Minister Owens were allowed to be targeted. They will be the ones the community will blame for Minister Owens' death. If any of the assassins survive the explosion, the police may even manage to question them and uncover that Minister Owens himself is responsible for the attacks in Charlie's house and the attempts to murder her. There are too many factors that can go right for the senator here that it isn't really worth any effort trying to save her opponent. In fact, Dante revealing that he is willing to do whatever it takes to ensure Charlie wins the election election is a huge asset to her team. They have many trained men as well as intelligence on the opponent's strategy and movements. They are the perfect candidates to carry out the senator's business without having to get her hands dirty. If I were Leo here, I would work very closely with Dante to eliminate all threats to the senator. Even if they are caught, I would keep her out of it and make sure everything is traceable back to me. So Charlie's reputation is not damaged at all. Using what we know, we could feed Dante information about the group of assassins Minister Owens has hired. Dante's men have the resources to capture one of them, and the resolve to use illegal, painful methods to get information out of the captive. In the best case scenario, this captive will be able to give us evidence that the new founding fathers are behind the plot to kill Senator Rowan. This concrete proof can be in the form of text messages, bank transactions, or emails that only the assassins would have, and that we need Dante's underhanded methods to get. This evidence can then be linked to the press shortly before the election to ensure that the public turns against Minister Owens and throws their support behind Charlie. Once she's in power, Hour, she can decide for herself if she wants to keep Dante's crew around as her private army or throw them under the bus as scapegoats to cover our tracks. As the van speeds out of the city, it is suddenly crashed into by another car and flips over. The assassins have found them again. The men drag the senator out of the van and force her into their vehicle. Leo gives chase and fires at them as they drive away, but it's too late. The vehicle is armored and already halfway down the street, the assassins have successfully kidnapped their target. Thinking about why they didn't kill her on the spot, Leo realizes that Minister Owens must want to oversee her public execution personally at the church event. Seeing no other choice, he resolves to rescue her on his own. Joe, Marcos, and Lady insist on joining him because they believe in Charlie's cause and know that electing her president is their only hope of ending the purge forever. They gather the weapons they can and leave on foot to rescue her. At the church, the assassins tie Charlie up, dress her in a white robe, and deliver the woman to the new founding fathers. In the pews, a congregation of people have gathered for a special purge mass. Minister Owens gets on stage and gives a speech about how important it is for the new founding fathers to stay in power, insisting that the purge is too important to end because it purifies those who stands against them. 
He then reveals the first person to be purified, a junkie he wishes to make amends for his behavior. The man has been tied up and is wheeled onto stage. Minister Owens unveils a table full of weapons that have been cleansed in holy water and invites this creepy priest to the stage. This man is a longtime supporter of the new founding fathers and is overjoyed that Owens has given him the honor of killing the first victim. The priest takes a knife and approaches the tied up man before viciously stabbing him repeatedly while the crowd watches, cheering him on. As the helpless man dies, Charlie watches in horror, knowing that she's next. In the tunnels underneath the church, the other four survivors catch up with Dante and his men. The bodyguard reveals they know about the plot to kill Minister Owens and tell them that the senator has been kidnapped to this location too. Leo tells Dante that the priority now should be to rescue the senator and that the original plans to target Owens are not as important. Finally on the same page, they enter the church from the tunnels and start to sneak up some stairs into the main hall. On stage, the minister gives another speech and tells the congregation that he has a special guest. The priest wheels Charlie out and the minister lifts the veil over her face. The crowd is overjoyed, excited to see the woman they hate killed off for good and erupt into applause. That's when the President of the United States is invited on stage and the minister makes it clear he will be the one who gets to execute Charlie. They have no idea that the survivors have reached the upper level of the church and are working quietly to kill the few guards patrolling the area. They ready their weapons as they look down on the execution that is about to happen below. Okay, this is terrifying. The president himself is so corrupt that he would murder a political opponent on stage without any of his followers batting an eye. His presence here makes sense alongside the new information Leo has gathered that the assassins were never trying to kill Charlie on the streets. They want to make a spectacle of her death in front of their followers. Someone as tactical and well-trained as Leo should have been prepared for this possibility. If I were Leo, I would have given the senator two things when we first escaped the house in case we ever got separated. First, I would have sewn a tracker into the lining of the bulletproof vest we give her, so I will be able to know her whereabouts at all times if we ever got separated. Next, I would give her a device no larger than a wallet, which can fit in her pocket. This would be a miniature version of the bomb that was planted in her office. This gives Charlie a last resort explosive that she can activate with the tap of her finger and use as a distraction or bargaining chip if she ever gets captured. If she activates it while around her kidnappers, they would recognize the beeping as an incoming explosion and run away from her. This gives her a chance to throw the device at them before blows up and use the distance they've created to make a run for it. Even better, if Charlie is brought into the company of someone important to the new founding fathers, such as Minister Owens, she can threaten to blow them all up unless she is set free. These tactics work perfectly with the fact that they want her alive. The assassins are more likely to give in to her demands than kill her on the spot or risk her blowing herself up in desperation. Leo's next problem is to figure out how to rescue the senator without risking her life. Since Minister Owens is there, it is very likely that security in the church will be very tight and heavily armed. He should avoid a gunfight at all cost, because Charlie could get killed in the crossfire. His best bet would be to catch a pair of followers in the street as they're walking or driving up to the church. Then, he can steal the clothes of one follower and leave them as a hostage with Dante's men to force the other follower to bring him safely into the church as their invited guests. While this is a risk, there are easily over a hundred followers in the church, and no one is paying any attention to them. Sneaking in this way is still far safer than starting a shootout. Once inside, he will be mere feet away from the senator and has a better shot of rescuing her. If the group thinks that Leo is too likely to be recognized, the plan can easily be replicated by one of Dante's men or one of the other survivors. So long as he look good in a suit, fit the demographic of new founding father's followers, and can act posh, they will be able to pull it off. On stage, the president picks up a sharp blade and approaches Charlie, holding it to her throat. He tells her that her death will be the rebirth of the nation and brings the knife forward, drawing blood. Just then, Marco shoots him in the head with a rifle and kills the president of the United States on the spot. It's a shocking moment that takes everyone by surprise, and a vicious gunfight breaks out as the guards fire into the upper level while the congregation panics, running for safety. Suddenly, more guards enter the building, and the survivors try to return fire but are overwhelmed. They are forced to take cover behind the pews as the the gunmen below mercilessly fire at them, but while they're hiding and unable to move, a new series of gunshots ring out. Then, everything goes silent. Peering out from their hiding spots, the survivors see that Dante and his men have killed all the guards and saved them. The survivors climb down to join them on the main floor and reunite with Charlie. She is shaken but unharmed. Gunshots continue to ring from other rooms in the building. Dante explains that his men are continuing to search the building in hopes of finding Minister Owens. Shortly after, Dante's soldiers tell them that they have found and captured Owens in a room in the basement level and are ready for him to execute the minister. Dante leaves to carry out this mission, but the survivors follow him to the lower level of the church. Senator Roan throws herself between Dante and the door, begging him not to execute Owens. The survivors and Dante's men have a tense standoff, with both sides drawing their weapons ready to shoot the other. Charlie pleads her case to Dante, saying that they shouldn't use the same methods as the 
evil new founding fathers. She urges him not to make matters worse by making their enemy a martyr and winning him more support. She asks that he trust her to win the election on her own and change life for the better for all of them. Unconvinced, Dante enters the room anyway and prepares to kill Owens. He points his pistol at the minister's head and gets ready to pull the trigger. After a short pause, he realizes that he'd be giving him exactly what he wants and refuses to do it. Dante emerges from the room with Owens, still alive, and tells the senator that she better beat him in the elections. The survivors enter the next room where a bunch of people have been held hostage and start to untie them, while Dante's group enters the parking garage to find escape vehicles. Suddenly, they are ambushed by the remaining assassins. Dante is shot in the stomach and falls to the ground. Hearing the gunfire, the bodyguard rushes out to help him, but the resistance leader knows he's dying and tells Leo to cover him as he has one final move to make. As Leo distracts the enemies, Dante hotwires a car and crashes it into two of the men, crushing them against a wall. That's when the lead assassin shoots Dante in the chest, killing the reluctant hero instantly, meaning Leo is the only person to face off against him. Okay, this is terrifying. None of these people seem to realize they have just killed the president. With him dead, there is now likely a power vacuum within the new founding fathers with Minister Owens as the new face of the party. This is the survivor's best chance to expose the minister for the lunatic he really is and take down the reputation of his entire party. The man is already yelling about murder and acting totally unhinged. If we put him in front of a video camera and talk about the dead president or using the purge to commit murder, he will be a goldmine of crazy quotes that are totally out of line for the next president to say. With some clever editing, we can even turn his ranting about murder and glee and others suffering into him celebrating the president's death or being behind the murder. Once the purge is over, the footage of Minister Owens making a fool of himself can be broadcast to the public, causing them to lose all confidence in the new founding fathers ahead of the election. Even the parishioners will back up this version of events. From their perspective, Minister Owens of the president on stage, as his men invited the president to come forward and kill Charlie. Shortly after, the president was shot from the upper floor, where only the minister's guards were stationed. The whole chain of events can easily be spun into an assassination planned by the minister to seize all power for himself. Dante and his men also made a critical error in trying to escape through the garage. If they had spoken to Charlie first about how many more threats she spotted while held hostage, she would have told him that the assassins who kidnapped her, as well as the crazy priest who stabbed a man to death, are still on the loose. In addition, they saw from the cells that dozens of parishioners escaped the main hall when the gunfight broke out. These are people devoted enough to the evil cause that they celebrated the thought of the senator getting murdered. There are simply too many unknowns in play for anyone to be venturing to new rooms like the garage. Even if there was no one else inside, any reinforcements coming to help their enemy would be lying in wait outside the church for any vehicle exiting the church. What the new founding fathers and their army would have heard from the followers who escaped is that the president and minister Owens were in the building when they were attacked. This means that they will be prepared to come in at full force to rescue their leaders. The survivors' best bet would be to retrace their steps and escape out the secret tunnels underneath the church which they entered through. In fact, Dante's team specifically reopened sealed tunnels for this mission so none of the new founding fathers are even aware they exist. Leo and the lead assassin exchange gunfire, but they both quickly run out of bullets. The man pulls out a combat dagger and charges at Leo. With no other choice, the bodyguard takes out his own knife and goes to face down the man in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Both men swipe each other many times and start to bleed badly, but despite being slashed across the chest and back, Leo manages to gain the upper hand. He stabs his opponent repeatedly before finishing the man off with a kick to the face, and the man slumps to the floor dead. Back in the basement room, one of the hostages freed by Charlie tries to run out in panic, but the door's opened by the creepy priest, and he's got a shotgun. He brutally shoots the man before entering the room and shooting Marcus in the shoulder. With his gun out of ammo, he takes out a pistol and aims it at his true target, Senator Rowan. Just before he can kill her, Joe jumps in front of her and the men shoot each other multiple times until the deli owner finally gets a lucky shot, blasting the insane priest in the head. The perjurer falls to the ground dead, and now they're finally safe. With that, the other survivors rush to Joe's side, but the man is already dying. He shares a nod of respect with Leo and tells his assistant Marcos to continue his legacy through his deli before drawing his final breath. Two months later, the senator finishes casting her vote while back at the deli. Marcos watches the results of the presidential election and finds out that Charlie has won the race, officially making her the president of the United States. As her first order of business, she vows to end the annual purge for good and finally put a stop to the senseless violence once and for all. That's when Lady visits him and they are both happy to see that Charlie has won. As they return to their day, the news reports that some factions have begun to launch violent protests, unhappy that Senator Rowan has won, teaching America an important lesson. You can't please everyone. But what do you think? How would you be the purge election year? Let me know with a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching, leave a like and subscribe, and check out the How to Be playlist for more videos like this. Until next time, have a damn good day.